Hey everybody, this is Mike Oppenheim and you are listening to Coffin Talk, interviews with the living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, coming to us live from San Francisco, California, is Amrit Evans. She was born and raised there, and she is now the manager of San Francisco Puppy Prep, a training school for puppies. Um, She actually grew up as a sick in the 3HO community. Go ahead and Google it. Uh, But she slowly faded from the practices by her 20s, and now in her free time, she's a gamer, athlete, dog mom, singer, and she spends time with her family and friends. So we're going to get into all that and more, but let's first start by saying hello to Amrit. How are you? Hello, I'm doing good today. Awesome. Um, Our standard trio of questions we ask guests at the beginning is, how old are you? Where did you grow up? Which we already went over. And what generation, if any, do you consider yourself a member of? Oh, good questions. Um, So I'm 31, grew up in San Francisco, and then I definitely think of myself as a millennial, solidly. I think I fit smack smack dab in the middle. Cool. We actually don't get that answer a lot, but I do get it sometimes. And it's interesting. I ask it because it kind of opens the door to some things and then sometimes it closes the door to other conversations but um I think <laughs> in these uh i'm hero- definitely not gen- i'm not gen b and i'm not yeah. older i have an older brother who's uh also a millennial so we're like you know yeah no. right in there so anyway, our, our mutual friend, Erin Graves, introduced us, and she was on, I think, podcast number five. When we met, uh, it was brief, actually. You, you talked a lot more to my wife, who normally is on the phone call, but she's pregnant and sleeping. <laughs> which is, I've, been, I've been saying behind the scenes to all the guests, but this is, I think, the first time I've said it on air. So um, yes, my, my wonderful wife, Alana, who many of you know, is pregnant with our second daughter, who should be arriving in February. Anyway, and the point is, she got to talk to you about this fascinating just aspect of your early life. It's not, you know, something I think now that's really a huge deal, but this, uh, this three HO community. So I would love to start there. Um, if you don't mind, can you just give us like whatever version you give people when you're not in a fiduciary, <laughs> but you also don't want it to turn into a six hour conversation? Yeah. So I tell people that I grew up Sikh, which, uh, three HO is definitely associated with, but it was, um, led by Yogi Bhajan, which, had it it was it was geared towards teaching yoga and also specifically teaching teaching americans um and so it's sort of like an offshoot of sikhism which is a much older religion hailing from india about 300 years ago um and so i grew up i wore a turban i grew up in san francisco the hub of 3ho was is based in new mexico um and so i i was actually not like when you think about a, a cult which i mean I think it's it's fair to say that 3HO is a cult. And that's it's a funny story on how I learned that. <laughs> I didn't learn it until I was 23. But um, You're definitely going to tell that story. So you can tell it now or you can tell it later. It's totally up to you. Uh, I'll, t- I'll tell it in a minute. But, um, okay. but it, it, I didn't physically grow up within a lot of proximity, like physical proximity. We had an ashram that was, you know, two blocks away from my house that I would go to on Sundays, um, not irregularly, but I grew up in San Francisco in private schools here, you know, doing the same things that a lot of other San Francisco kids were doing, except I was doing it and wearing a turban at the same time. And so I looked a little different, um, even if I was sort of participating in a lot of very similar experiences there. Uh, but yeah. And since this is a, um, this is a vocal medium, so like, do you look? I'm not asking how you actually identify, but do you look white for the most part? I'm incredibly white. I, I like to say that if you took various different parts of Europe, shook it up, and <laughs> threw it in a blender for in America for nine generations, that's what I look like. Um, I just so for people visualizing, there's no one looking at you being like, Oh, is she from India? No, like was... no, um, absolutely. And people say it all the time, they like, uh, you know, they they see my name written, whether on a resume or on a lift ride or something like that. And they see me and they're like, oh, I was expecting someone Indian. <laughs> I'm like, you were probably also <laughs> expecting a man because Amrita is traditionally the woman's version. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. So f- full disclosure, I talked to Erin for more than two years and she would mention you all the time, especially as your wedding approached. And Never until I met you did I for a second not think you were Indian. Yeah, but I'm not, <laughs> and I wouldn't expect anything else from <laughs> as somebody who has not met me originally. Um, once you see me, there's no doubt. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and I didn't, like, 
you know, I know some some people within the community had friends or family who either were husbands or wives or something that had roots in India. Um, my family didn't. Both of my parents converted to Sikhism when they were in their 20s. Um, and so both of them very, you know, traditionally white looking, um, but interested in the yogic practice. And um, that led them to, to, to be a part of the 3HO community. Um, yeah. And so 3HO, yeah, I was talking about cults and it is a cult. It was a cult. It, it, I, I know that it's, it's still in existence um, and what it is, is changing. Um, Yogi Bhajan, I don't remember all my history very well, but I know he died in the 90s. And so it was when I was pretty young that, the, that the, the leader of that community died. But what he did was he put all of his teachings into VHS format. <laughs> and so a lot of his yogic practices and his teachings and his beliefs were carried on long after the fact. Um, yeah, and so my, like, I, it was actually, I was in, well, oh, the other thing about Sikhism, so wearing turbans is a big part of it, but also we never used to cut our hair. So I had never cut my hair. Like, you know, you know, young kids might sneak alcohol or sneak a smoke or something like that. But like, I was in my bedroom sneaking, cutting my little bangs in the very front, like just a little bit so that maybe my mom wouldn't notice it, but enough that I had done it and like knew what it felt like. <laughs> Like, um, wow. yeah, and so I didn't cut my hair. I didn't properly cut my hair until I was 19, and I had moved out of the house. And my brother had done the same before me. Um, he's about three years older than I am. Um, and so it's interesting because I'm also the little sister, so a lot of the sort of internal house um, experiences of my, my brother also hadn't cut his hair, and he was a guy, and I was a girl, and that's harder to be a guy with very long hair. Um, and his hair was thicker and more difficult than mine. And so um, he had sort of gone through that experience already of telling my mom and talking to my parents that he's going to cut his hair and then doing it in college. And so by the time uh, that I came into the same spot, my mom had kind of already been through it. So it wasn't quite as like I didn't get the harder version of that. Um, I didn't have to fight that battle nearly as much as my yeah, brother did because yeah. he, he did it first. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until I was actually 19 that I, uh, like cut my hair and kept cutting it and kept cutting it and it got shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, but it was a really big emotional shift because it, it was like the, it was, it's such a physical representation of in-group, out-group experience, which is one thing that particularly wow. like, there, there's actually a list. So, when it comes to um, cults and what defines a cult, if you Google cult on the internet, there's like a list of, I don't know, 30 different definitions. And if you meet more than half of them, it's likely that your community is a cult. And that was exactly how I learned is my brother came over. I was hanging out. Gosh, I was, it might've even been after college. I might've been like 23. Cause I'm pretty sure I was back in San Francisco at that point. Um, and he goes, yeah, yeah. Something, something. We grew up in a cult. And I was like, what? He's like, what? What do you mean? What? <laughs> like, we grew up in a cult, and I was like, but if we did grow up in a cult, it wasn't a very bad one, and you know, and he's like, yeah, all right, yeah. you need to Google it, and so I googled the definition of cult exactly, and it was like way more than fifty percent. It was like everything, everything. I was like, yeah, this is cult. This is cult. This is cult. Like it, it is that one hundred percent. It has an individual figurehead. There's in group out group manipulation there's social pressure there like I, I don't remember them all off the top of my head but i was like undeniably we fit the, fit the bill wow and i mean you know like so i'm not religious at all and i host a show where i inter you know interview people of all religions and i would say that i'm polite about religion but in general i assume all religions were what we call a cult now and then they just either got big and people stopped calling them one or not <laughs> does that actually like ring a bell with you yeah i mean i agree with that that resonates okay yeah the biggest difference that i that 
I see tends to come out for me at least is like the idea of an individual or an individualistic figurehead. Um, and this is sort of what, why I like when I sit with the idea between like Sikhism as a religion versus 3HO as a cult is that like Yogi Bhajan was the head of the community. And so he was willy nilly deciding like, I have religious teachings and I have religious practices that come from the Sikh religion that are passed down. You know, the idea that God is everything and everything is God. And there is this sort of fundamental um, unity of the universe, which I can very easily sort of attribute to my scientific leanings to go, okay, well, quarks are really small and there are other things that are even smaller than quarks. And then if you just keep building it down, smaller and smaller there's probably something we don't know about and that something might be uniform in some capacity and at least it's matter and energy and we are all that and so like i can kind of define it that way um yeah, at least yeah. that was that you. was where yeah. i grew, how i grew up with it um and like but when when yogi bhajan was saying well you can't pierce your ears unless you fill it with diamonds because the way that your body's energy resonates, it will only continue to resonate in the same way when you fill your piercings with diamonds. That was one that I remember hearing and being like, well, that sounds like total BS because how would you set that diamond? Mm -hmm. You're not gonna have like a, like, <laughs> you know, a, a, a yeah, metallic yeah. casing for your diamond ear. Like, it didn't make sense to me um and that was very much like yeah. a he said versus you know this this other person who said other things a long time ago that has sort of morphed um the thing about being in the cult is that there is a very active influence of of having an individual leader which is why i think it was so so profound that he like recorded all of his teachings in a way that was um lasted beyond his years yeah, and that totally makes sense to me. And I think that's kind of like, you know, I've read a lot of books on cults, either by accident or intentionally. And the reason why is my parents moved to Iowa to join a transcendental meditation movement there. And they'd been in the movement since the 70s, and I grew up with it. And that's the only phase of my life where I was like, oh, this is either cult adjacent or cult. And I would visit them a lot. And uh, mm -hmm. I it's really like on the border between both. And I know that a lot of people who listen to this are in that community, or not a lot, but it's not that the people struck me as culty or that the practice of transcendental meditation is culty. It was like literally my parents' decision to move to a community and the reasons why is what I'm talking about. So, yeah, I think that one of the things, part of the reason why I say, well, if I grew up in a cult, it wasn't a very bad one. Really the way that that's coming out is because of the way that my parents raised me within that community. Okay. Um, because I, I do think that there are other people that had different experiences than mine that were either closer to the heart of things or just didn't, or who had parents who were more strict in some ways or more believing in some ways. Um, and they had much worse experiences than I do. Um, my, my dad was actually somewhat, uh, I didn't, I didn't really understand this until later, but he had uh, started a publication early on speaking out of, against Yogi Bhajan wow. early in the, in the years because he could see sort of the writing on the wall and the, and the abuse of power that was going on. And so he was actually collecting writing and, and publishing this, at which point he, he was basically asked to stop and ostracized in that capacity, which created an interesting, you know, family dynamic because I didn't understand that at the time and I thought my dad was you know there one of the things that's really strong in cults is this sense of moral um rightness of like you know the better of a practitioner of the cult you are the better of a person you are and so like my dad used to eat meat he had a kidney transplant he his doctor told him you had to eat meat um and then he did and then he liked it so he continued to do so and that wasn't within the teachings of the community and so that felt like oh my dad is he's a Sikh but he's a bad Sikh he's not very good at it so no wonder you know people are not as accepting of him in that regard um and and no, it's because you know, it's it's because he doesn't he didn't choose to take everything that was handed to him and live it 
by law. Like he chose to pick and choose amongst the teachings what he liked and what he didn't. And I would say that my mom did the same thing. You know, a lot of uh, the parents of the people in in our community were encouraged or um, convinced or pressured to send their kids to a school in India. Um, which separated families, created a, a, a power dynamic. You know, there was a whole bunch of stuff that happened there that I, I can't even really speak to because it's not my own experience. Um, but my mom was like, yeah, I mean, you might. Like, there was at one point when I was interested, I, I had friends. I had people who um, I, I was close to who went to school in India, and I was like, wow, that's so cool. And you get, like, the spiritual power from going and learning and the dedication and the, you know, the 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 fortitude that you build from that sort of um experience would be really cool and my mom was like yeah uh-huh would you rather do that or would you rather go get an education in san francisco <laughs> <laughs> and, and she, if, if i had had a different mom who had even somewhat wanted me to go i'm sure that i would have had a different experience um and so uh, so the story of my brother telling me that we were in a cult later that um in that week or that month or something, I, I go. I was like, "Well, how how on earth? Like, my mom is a smart smart person. My dad is a smart person. How could they have been in this community and not know that they were in a cult? How did like I didn't know, but how did they not know?" And so I I like went up to my mom later. I was like, "Um, mom, Guru says that we were in a cult. Is that true?" <laughs> and my mom goes, "Oh yeah, I know." Wow. I was like, what? You knew? You knew and you didn't tell me? She's like, yeah, I mean, I knew, but there were things about it that I liked and there were things about it that I didn't. And so I just picked amongst that, just like anybody does with any religion. And here we are. <laughs> wow, I have no idea. And so I think I, even within that community, got a relatively unique experience because my, my parents were definitely sort of go it on their own way type of people mm -hmm. um to to do what they thought was going to be the best setup um so sort of like 3 ho a chase i suppose but definitely going to church regularly on sundays and stuff like that and like you never had like a best friend in high school or someone who was like yo like you you say weird words like none of us even know what 3 ho means like is that water like what like that never happened <laughs> I mean, people, the most common thing was that people had questions about my turban. Okay. And they had questions about uh, why I didn't cut my hair. And they had questions um, about what I did when I went to the, the Sikh camp that happens over the summer. Um, but I wasn't, like, like, I was the kind of kid who, my mom used to pay me when I was a young kid. She was like, 25 cents every day you come home with your turban still on. <laughs> But it was a it was a struggle. Like it would fall off. It, it's a kid running around on a playground. Your your hat falls off. Yeah. Like, and so, and when I hit middle school, I got to a point where I could tie it myself. And so there I was, like you know, emo kid wearing like all black with like pink hot topic skull on my chest and like this bright white <laughs> turban. It did not fit the vibe. <laughs> And so I would go in, take my turban off immediately, do the rest of my day of school, and then put my turban on before I left school and, like, pretend like I had worn it all day. I, um, and so I definitely wasn't embracing it. <laughs> What's funny to me, too, is, like, I want to paint for my audience. Like, I grew up in the Bay Area, so, like, it's really not actually that weird. <laughs> it's just, like, so <laughs> weird. Like, if any girl in my high school or any grade, you know, for that matter, had worn a turban, the teacher would have said, like, this is Amrit, and, like, she wears a special turban. Do you want to explain what it's for? And then we all would have clapped, and we would have asked you questions, and then we would have had, like, more diversity lunch, and then, like, you know what I mean? So it's, like, interesting that, like, I can see how you really didn't know. Like, it really does make sense to me. Like, in any other yeah. state, I mean, <laughs> except the one place in New Mexico you mentioned, it would be, like, outrageous to hide this from you. And... I mean, this is my wording. Like, would you say your parents were hiding from you that you were in a cult, or they just kind of expected you to figure it out when you figured it out? I don't think that... I mean, nobody who is in a cult likes to self-identify as such. That's a good point, yeah. 
I think that they knew that they that that we were part of a unique community. <laughs> no avoiding that. Um, and I also think that they knew not to take Yogi Bhajan at his word for everything that he said. Like both of my parents were really um, good teachers of what I would call critical thinking of, you know, investigate the information that's coming to to you, analyze it for yourself and see what fits and what doesn't. And like the thing that was the thing that when I say I grew up in this community, but it was not a bad like it wasn't a very bad cult. It's like my my mom had left a much uh, a much more strict, a much more rigid Christian family um, that she was the black sheep of that family. And she one of the reasons that she actually no longer continued speaking with her father was um, because she had con- converted to Sikhism. Um, and he he was not interested in having a relationship with her after that point. Um, and so a large part, and, and I would say not exactly in the same way, um, but my dad also was a little bit um, different from his own family. And so one of the things that the Sikh community in San Francisco really provided me was a sense of family. Um, like we would do kid nights where I went over to other like kids families homes in the community we, we would rotate Friday night was you know candle making we used to get Ethiopian food and then slide down the stairs at another family's house and it was like it was a very community driven place um but it's interesting that now even in this year I'm having conversations with my cousin who um who uh, who also continued to grow up in that Christian lifestyle and how she struggled with a lot of different um, ways of sort of shutting down her personhood through that religious lifestyle in a way that I never had to deal with, even though my community was weird and different. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and Christianity is something that we see as mainstream and, and is common, Um just because it's normal doesn't mean it's not constricting. Um, And so like for, for me, uh, it's really interesting to hear how she, she like, I knew that if my parents passed, I wasn't going to be going to another uh, family member by blood's home in, in that situation. I knew that I would be going to another Sikh member's house. That would be the plan because we would be raising our kids with a more similar lifestyle. And it's interesting to talk to my cousin about it now because she said the same thing. She was like, yeah, I mean, you were our favorite cousins. You were the most fun to hang out with. And, and my mom always said, like, treat them like, even though they do something a little differently, like treat them nicely. Uh, But we also knew that if something happened to our parents, there's no way that we were going to end up at your house. (laughs) Like it was too different. And so, I mean, it's, it's interesting how that, that cuts through family lines because of what a different, how much of a different belief that that people hold in terms of the way they want to live their life on a daily basis. So it's, to me, like knowing you from, you know, when I actually met you in person and from this conversation, you seem like actually extremely tolerant of like all disparate beliefs and stuff, which um, this might sound strange to you, but we grew up in the same area. I actually don't associate that with the Bay Area. I associate it almost as like the opposite, like a preachy, this tolerance but not that tolerance and so i'm curious a it was what i'm saying not about san francisco you don't have to s talk where you're from if you don't want it. but uh <laughs> d- does that um does that kind of gel with you i mean do you feel that way or do you or is that just within religion that you're like that um do i feel like i'm more open to various different things you seem like you're you're willing to yeah like so specifically with religion in the bay area i grew up and a lot of people are like atheists there and a lot of people um aren't religious but there's like an it's okay to say religion is dumb like in public there and yeah it's not really okay in most other cities in america and i'm not saying that that's like san francisco sucks because they say that i'm just trying to point something out about growing up there that i was blown away that like when i moved out and you know pretty much i, I came back for 10 years but like i was surprised by how much religion dominates conversation and attitude and ethics in america yeah and so you seem to be very open to like all of it from your experience so i'm just curious like Because right now, it's like a big hot topic in all conversations is like, does religion in the United States, does it permeate 
politics or not. Like, are we doing this because of religion or are we doing this because of ethics? Which is which? So you seem very tolerant to like, hey, you know, people grow up with religion and they just like end up being what they're like. So that's kind of what I'm I'm getting from you. Does Do you feel that as like self-identity or am I misrepresenting you yeah so if um i guess i I, i'm hearing a couple different things there one is about like how does the Mm -hmm. bay area reflect like i would definitely say you're right that you can say religion is dumb and i also would say that i didn't feel like i was swimming uphill in a religious community in a way that i was different like Mm -hmm. i moved i visited my cousins in Cary, illinois in maybe 11th grade or 10th grade or something like that and it was like it felt i felt so other i felt so different when i was there in a way that i mm-hmm. definitely don't feel in san francisco um i felt like everybody else was doing this one thing that i hadn't grown up with didn't understand and also thought was a little bit bs um and so i i didn't have a way to relate to that very easily and i was only there for like three days so i I mean i i probably could have found some common ground but i would have i would have had it i would have had to feel super confident with my own beliefs not to want to swim with the crowd um and at least like i i could imagine myself if i had moved to a community like that being like well i guess i'll you know go to church why not and then Mm -hmm. you sort of why not your way into um (laughs) Uh, a system that doesn't maybe work for you super well. Um, and so for me, when I think about all of re- religion, there is no doubt in my mind that that people's motives and ideals are based off of what they believe. And if what they believe is faith or religion based, that uh, that's going to work its way into politics. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that that's going to happen. Um, I also, I sort of, if, if you ask me now, where do I sit religion wise, I think of myself as uh, an agnostic, because I think it's, mm-hmm. I think it's hubris to say that you absolutely know that there is no God. Um, because I can say for certain, the one thing that I know is that I don't know. Um, and anybody else who says that they do has, uh, has just as little proof of evidence as I do. Um, and so whether that is that you do believe in God or that you do not believe in God, it isn't something that anybody can prove. But I do think that when your beliefs actively hinder or um, influence or affect, particularly people who do not believe what you believe, that's where there's a real struggle and a real difficulty um in in the way that uh religion is practiced in my opinion i mean i think one of the things that is well i honestly think whether i i am particularly religious or not i think that sikhism is a beautiful religion i think that the Mm -hmm. the the fundamental beliefs that are there are really really ones to be um aspired to which is the idea of equality not just amongst race or amongst gender but against like wealth and um social status like part of the reason that good uh hold a lunger which is a meal um in which everybody sits on the floor together it doesn't matter if you're a king or a pauper like you are all together sharing in that in that same space and that idea is so important and so powerful and particularly where india's history has come from like i i also don't know enough about it but you know when you had people who were literally untouchable and and then kings that 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 idea shakes the world and i think that that is the idea that is beautiful in most religions which is we want to be kind we want to help our people we want to help the community around us we are stronger for helping each other but when those ideas become you know conflicts and war and crusades over the sake of religion of forcing religion upon other people over um you know excluding other people's culture by the the use of religion to say the only way to do it is this way like that's where it goes wrong and i don't think that it's excusable (laughs) (laughs) and it's funny because i agree with you and i'm like is this because we're just both from the bay area or is it because we just agree i think it's because we just agree but i I agree with every single thing you just said and it's it's interesting because this podcast is designed to help people see that like 
you really phrase it really well. It's like the, it's the audacity or the arrogance. I, I can't remember which word to use, so I'm using both. Um, to just say like I'm sure of something, and the rest of you who are also sure are wrong. And it's just crazy to me that the world has actually accepted that as like a reason to fight, bicker, and go to war. So I'm I'm totally with you. Um, we are running out of time actually, and I could talk to you for like. I, I said at the beginning as a joke, like six hours. I really, could, <laughs> I might just have to have you back on again, honestly. Um, but before I let you go, I would love two things. One, I would love to hear what you actually think happens when you die. Cause we do ask every single guest that. And so I'm just curious now at the age of 31, you know, you're, you're 10, 11, 12 years removed from living with your parents and being immersed in three HO. Uh, what do you actually think is going to happen when, when you die? Hey everyone. If you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks. Um, I'm going to give you two answers. <laughs> All right. I'm uh, okay with the that. first one is a Keanu Reeves quote. <laughs> he says, uh, the people who love you are sad. And I think that that is so beautiful because it, it's yeah. one of the few things we can count on. And as far as what happens to me, I have a lot less understanding. I consider the concept of myself dying, or when I consider the concept of those I love dying, I think of how, um, you know, every, every molecule, like our world is made up of molecules and atoms and small particles that are um, in, a, in a, you know, soup of um, material. And so I think that when we die, we blend in with that soup. Um, and I don't know what level of consciousness or lack of consciousness or experience that there is within that. I mean, I know that I sleep regularly and I don't know about it. So I think that it's conceivable mm -hmm. to me that when I die, I, I would feel similarly. Um, I can't imagine that death is painless. Um, so I imagine that it's not a beautiful process along the way. There are plenty of other things in life that are not, um, you know, <laughs> that seem uh, unnecessary and uh, and also don't seem to have an apparent purpose, but are also annoying and difficult to deal with. And so I don't know that uh, death has any reason to be anything other than that. Um, but I I like to believe that when this physical body is ended that we, you know, we are not, we are not out of the universe. We have not been taken out of it. It's just that we've been recycled <laughs> into other purposes. <laughs> That's kind of the way that I see it. That's cool. I really like that answer. I like that a lot. Um, it's definitely uh, respectable and I, I appreciate your perspective and where you're coming from and all that. You really do blend like a sense of spirituality with science. And it's interesting. I don't meet, or know a lot of people like you. So it's, it's been cool to talk to you about all that. Uh, this is your opportunity at the end of the podcast. I always just let people have the floor. Is there anything you want to say to the people listening? I thank you for caring and thank you for thinking. I think that um, that's all we can do. And, you know, I, I think that spirituality and understanding of how we fit into the universe is such a journey that um, no matter where you are along it, it is helpful to be respectful and, um, understanding of others and i think even beyond that uh encouraging and supporting of others i think one of the things that i, I we didn't even get to what happened to 3ho in the last three <laughs> years which has has really shook the community and yes maybe we do have me on another time because i could talk about yeah. it a lot longer one of the things that is the biggest grief in that process is is the isolation from people is the isolation from community is the isolation of feeling like there was a part of myself that is no longer extant um and that the people that i might have formed connections with that you know we went different ways or were encouraged to go different ways because of that pressure um that that's where i personally feel a significant amount of pain um and so the whole point of religion as i see it is a way of bringing communities together and a way of supporting one another and so if that's not what you're doing um really consider it <laughs> and look at it hard um and if there's a way to uplift people whether you are religious or not that is the whole point in my opinion wow 
that was that was great that was really well said um i honestly think we will probably have you back on you're not only an extraordinary guest but you're very funny and you're quick and i enjoyed talking to you so thank you again so much Amrit. the best way to support the show is just to head over to mikeyop.com that's m-i-k-e-y-o-p-p.com and for everyone listening thank you again for tuning in my name is mike oppenheim you have been listening to coffin talk and we will see you soon